we're going to our last panel of the day, Modern Supervision, What is Key? And which follows, obviously, from the, from the panel before. The moderator of this panel is Naomi Lloyd, a presenter, media trainer, and journalist for Euronews. Naomi will introduce the panelists, so over to you, Naomi. Thank you, Connie. Well, we heard in our previous discussion the stock take, the progress that's been made over 10 years. And this panel, we're looking to the future. At a time of unpredictability, with one global crisis seeming to follow another, the demands on the banking supervisor have changed fundamentally, we agree. And at the same time, the banking business is being shaped by the digital transformation. So how to adapt? How to ensure that modern banking supervision stays modern, is modern, in the face of the next crisis from whatever that comes? Well, with me to bring clarity and illumination to this topic are my distinguished panel of guests who need very little introduction, but they are Marlene Amstead on the left, who is chair of the Swiss Financial Market Supervisory Authority. We have Jose Manuel Kemper, chair of the EBA, Kirstin Afjoknik, member of the supervisory board here at the ECB. We have Davide Talienti, chair of global public sector at Oliver Wyman, an international management consultancy firm. And Nicolas Terry, chair of Credit Mutuel. So a warm welcome to all of you, a very distinguished panel. As I said, before we dive in, a reminder that we do want to hear from you. We want to have audience questions and we will be allowing time for that at the end. Whether you're online, do send them in now or here, we'll have the roving microphone later. So hold on to those burning questions and we will do our best to come to them. So let's get started. My first question then to our panel is, how would you define a modern supervisor in just two or three words? I'm gonna ask all of you and start with Marlene and then work our way along. So Marlene, to you first. Well, if I have only, really only three words, I would say first traditional, which might come as a surprise, hmm. <laughs> uh, technology neutral and uh, tech savvy. Okay, thank you. Jose Manuel. Um, to complement those, I would say forward-looking and intrusive. Thank you. I would say intrusive because uh, we need to turn all the stones and challenge banks. I would say uh, flexible and agile because we need to adjust to the um, risks and the outlook for the economy. And then I would also like to say fair because uh, as a SSM supervisor, we have some very large banks, but we have also smaller ones. So it's important that we are proportionate and that we also create a level playing field for all the banks. Thank you. Davide. Can't we just clone him? <laughs> uh, no, two for you. Organizational psychologist, curiously, and then a historian. It'll come back later. Okay. For me, and after 10 years, normally in the following five years, you have the first love story. So the love story between the supervisor and the banks should be on three proofs of love. First, uh, focused, then open-minded, and dynamic. Thank you. I like the mention of the love story. So that gives us a flavor of the discussion to come. My next question to you then, and I believe you've come prepared, is what key tool should every modern supervisor have at their disposal? And I do believe you've each, hopefully, bought an object that represents this. I do like a bit of show and tell. And we'll go in the opposite direction. Nicola, to you first. So the object is a four colors pen because you have to draw the, the mountains and valleys. Uh, this is the, the global picture. And then you have to move banks from black to green <laughs> and with some red and some blue in encouraging or uh, penalizing. Very nice. Thank you. Davide. Mine, Nomi, is not really an object. It's a work of art. Oh, it is. It is a total work of art. <laughs> come back to my history point. Okay. <laughs> so do you remember when the um, Roman generals paraded after winning their wars in Gaul or wherever, conquering the, the rest of Europe? I'm, I'm a Roman, by the way, so I'm very <laughs> so it comes natural. There were, the, the emperor always had somebody right behind him saying two words. What do they say? Memento mori. You're going to die as well. Okay. Now, how is this relevant? Well, it's relevant as follows. Any chief executive needs the people within his organization or her organization to say, memento mori. 
you are a very dominant person at this point, you're a very dominant institution, and you need to be aware of your vulnerabilities. Carrying the scars of 12 years of having the pleasure of working with, with the ECB on all the various banking crises, history repeats itself all the time. And it's very clear that the absence of a memento mori within a failing institution is what causes that. Uh, so this is the tool that any supervisor should hand over to the chief executive and say, just remember. <laughs> Thank you, Kirsty. So uh, for me, uh, our staff are the most important in uh, the staff. They are an asset. So I brought a photo of uh, our staff. Oh. Uh, and you know, we have uh, 1,100 people in here at the ECB, but we are working together with all our member countries. So together, we uh, are more than thousands. And here, they, I think there is a running competition. So they, it's very good that they are also doing healthy things, not just working on banking supervision. Very important. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, I, for me, I brought the iPad technology. I think very much aligned to what you said before. And I think as we go forward, being technology savvy is very important for any of us. Thank you. It's a very similar story. <laughs> 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 Interesting to the it's, same it's object. It's not just the iPad. I that's thought, a laptop. I, I, I thought more <laughs> of kind of, first I thought of uh, the more traditional uh, version of the iPad. So I thought actually of, an, of a magnifying glass because I very much believe that when it comes to modern supervision, I think we really need to focus much more on data. So banks more than ever are data banks, yeah. and uh, there are huge piles of, of, of data, and so it gets more and more important that we do not only collect the right data and do not only connect then the right data, but that we have a magnifying glass where we can that really should have been your focus object. a magnifying on, glass. Exactly, <laughs> focusing really on, uh, in a risk-based way uh, where the highest risks lie. Okay, thank you. Thank you to all of you. So as we're saying, we heard in the last panel the stock take on 10 years of European banking supervision. Kirsten, from the ECB banking supervision perspective, briefly, where are we at right now? What challenges lie ahead and what's needed to adapt? I, I think I, I'm a part of the story here a little bit, but I think we have made remarkable progress over the last 10 years. Uh, I was uh, chairing the Committee of European Banking Supervisors in 2008 and 9 when we were in the middle of the financial crisis and it was a very difficult time for supervisors. There were no trust in supervisors, there were no cooperation among the supervisors, there were different practices as was mentioned here earlier. So we have really made a remarkable result. Uh, the banking union step is of course a very important for us. There is more to do, as was also said here earlier. I mean, we would like to see the full banking union uh, up and running with the uh, deposit insurance scheme and the uh, full crisis management framework so that we can use also more tools in the crisis situation. Okay, thank you. Well, then the same question to you, Nicola, from the banking perspective. The challenges, what do you see? What's needed to adapt? Well, first of all, I, I want to pay tribute to Andrea and Ria because uh, before adapting, you have to recognize uh, the assets. Uh, and there is, for me, and that's the reason of my presence today, uh, real assets uh, coming from the supervision mechanism. Notably, um, the focus on business models and the forward-looking uh, and the future of capital and liquidity. And uh, I would add a, a very psychological element which is uh, the confidence, the trust of dialogue, and the clarity of uh, the main priorities. And please do not adapt on that. Uh, it's important for the industry to have this kind of uh, previsibility and, uh, and clarity. Then we have common challenges, and uh, the main one for me is, of course, the risk profiles, and notably on climate but uh, also uh, to avoid because uh, banking is still a national industry. We have some national traditions. You know, in France, we have uh, regulations on savings. We have uh, fixed interest rates. Uh, we have a sort of social role of the banking industry. And uh, uh, on the risk profile, 
I understand the need uh, for unity, but there is no unity without recognition of diversity. And so uh, that's where I think there is some room of maneuver for adaptation. Then the second thing is uh, um, the previsibility of the supervisor. And uh, uh, I would say that sometimes having a common working table, common working program, leaving room for urgencies, of course, but would help to build this confidence and to create uh, an ability for each uh, bank, each and every bank, to uh, have a proper risk management dynamic. And that's where I, I think it's maybe very practical, very bureaucratic, but that's important on both sides. Okay. Thank you. So we've, we've touched on the demands of the, how the demands of the banking supervisor have changed. So let's start with digitalization. It's rapidly changing the banking landscape. So let's have a talk about what are the implications of that for banking supervision. Marlene, can I come to you first? What do you see? Well, digitalization of journey of banks uh, definitely is a long and winding journey, and and uh, we're posing many many challenges, but also uh, opportunities. We see that globally. Uh, we see it in, uh, recently with the introduction of decentralized finance and permissionless uh, business models. Uh, we've seen that also in Switzerland uh, a couple of years ago when uh, DM and and, and Libra. Uh, applied for a payment uh, license in uh, Switzerland. And so from all of these experiences, I would say I, I see three core uh, principles that really matter from a supervisory uh, perspective when it comes to uh, digitalization of, of banking. I think the, the first one is, is transparency. I think it's, it's really of utmost importance that uh, we have transparency in, in, those, in, in those business models and that's much easier said than, than actually, uh, than actually ad achieved. And the, the second uh, core principle I see in digitalization is the international cooperation because with these digital models, we see they uh, do not uh, really end at the jurisdictional borders. And so more than ever, it is of utmost importance that we as supervisor, we have the same common uh, standards or common language, the similar taxo taxonomies. And so international cooperation, I think, in the digitalization of banking uh, is, is really of, of great uh, importance. And then the last aspect uh, is, again, I would say technology neutrality seems to me an important uh, core principle just uh, in order not to, to, for us as supervisors to pick the technology, but instead we set the guidelines, we set the rules, uh, we set the expectations, but in terms of which technology is the most innovative one, uh, that is then left uh, to the industry. So technology neutrality as a uh, way to achieve on the one hand innovative, but on the other hand uh, also safe financial markets. Thank you. And we're going to talk about transparency more as well. That is a key one. Davide, you have also a global perspective. What, what are you seeing related to that and your thoughts? For those of you that have studied China, um, and for good and for bad, by the way, in terms of the financial system, it's a uniquely interesting market. I'm going to exaggerate really brutally for effect, yeah. but if you look at the Chinese market at the moment, you have the big techs, their equivalent of the, the, the big techs, that occupy the client interface role, and they run away with all the economic value. Mm -hmm. You then have a very disorganized non-bank financial institution segment with all the bonds that we've all heard that is a mess and is probably going to be cleaned. It'll take about 20 years to clean up. And then, of course, you've got the banks, the traditional banks, right? These, I'm exaggerating for effect, but the market has coalesced into these three broad segments with almost all the value accruing into the big techs. What is extraordinary about it is not just how much the value has migrated away from the traditional banking sector, but it's the pace at which it happened. So six years ago, the big techs were basically nothing in financial services in China, six or seven years ago, and now they are an utter dominant force. 
even after the crackdown that happened quite recently that we've all, that we've all seen. Now, why am I raising this? Because in Europe, it doesn't feel like we're in a stable end game. Most banks are trading at half book value. Any sector, in any other sector, this would have been consolidated out, right? There would have been forces of consolidation that would have squeezed out the weaker players and we'd have much stronger and better, better valued uh, banks. It doesn't feel stable. Something is stopping that development. And I fear that we're probably on the cusp here, fear, I hope, I don't know, it'll be for Claudia to see with her colleagues as she looks at the next five years, that the AI disruption, which really is the manifestation of digital, may well accelerate some of the competitive differentiators in the market. If you look at the potential in productivity that AI brings within a financial institution, if it's just applied internally, before we even look outside in the market, it's phenomenal. So the banks that adopt this at pace are going to have material cost advantage to most of their peers and therefore will have the power to consolidate, maybe. That's even before the big techs decide to play in the game, which at the moment they've said pretty clearly, we don't really want to play in European financial services. It's too much regulation for us, right? They're, they're the tech bros. They don't want to be regulated. I mean, God, why would you want to be regulated? Um, when that changes, that could really start an interesting consolidation dynamic. Now, for supervisors, this is nothing short of a nightmare because you're, looking, you're probably looking at M&A situations that involve banks and non-banks, never seen them before. Second thing you're looking at is risk of disruption within the business models of the established players. Let's try and backtest on generative AI. By definition, that's impossible, mm -hmm. right? And then the third is that you have a real human capital challenge, which is the institutions, uh, the banks and the insurance companies aren't really the most advantaged kn knowers of this technology. So there's going to be some slippage here, for sure. And as a supervisor, through my shred processes, through my other things, I need to get a gauge of where is it that something could go wrong in this institution above and beyond all the traditional prudential levers which is why, Naomi, I said an organizational psychologist, because I think a sh there's a difference between a shrep and a shrep. And a tick box shrep is a disaster. Mm. A forward-looking, business model challenging shrep that I think Nicolas was alluding to makes all the difference. And to have supervisors that can do that, that's tricky. Thank you. Well, there's nothing short of a nightmare stood out to me. Kirsten, maybe to you as well. How prepared are you for this? I mean, uh, on the digital uh, agenda, I would say that we are doing quite a lot and we have my colleague Elizabeth is chairing our steering committee for the digital agenda. And so, but, and on banks, I mean, we are, um, this is one of our priorities in our discussions with banks to make sure that they are making use of the digital solutions in their also, change of the business models because we want, I mean, there are a number of banks which, uh, who don't have really a sustainable business model and here we think that digital solutions can help them in the uh, future development. Having said that, we made a questionnaire to a number of banks in the beginning of the year uh, to ask a little bit, where are you? Uh, and um, uh, most banks have a digital agenda. Uh, most banks are, of course, developing solutions for their customers, did better solutions. Uh, but very few uh, banks had a transformation budget. I mean, they, you also, it's an investment to make sure that you can make use of the uh, digital solutions. So that is something that we will continue to discuss because we think that is important to invest for the future. So Nicola, let me throw that to you. Are you investing? Do you have the dedicated transformation budget? Yeah. Sorry to put you on the spot. Yeah. No, but I will come, I, I will be very brutal, sorry. But uh, the banking industry is just about IT, human resources and customers. Uh, we have no intellectual property protection. So uh, on the digitalization, I have a sing two single words, full control full control of your IT system, no externalization, no public cloud. You have to control your system, your architecture, and at the core of your architecture, you need to have customers. Uh, 
And then you can protect your system, you can be resilient, no externalization, no public cloud, to be honest. And when I'm looking at different organizations and then when I see them going to the public cloud, for me, that's a clear and present danger signal. Mm -hmm. So on this basis, 8% of the workforce of Credit Mutuel is on IT. Uh, we are spending 1 million days each year on IT developments. We put AI on our system, on mainframes, exclusively in France, because also for an environmental point of view, if you want to avoid to enlighten things in Alaska, Greenland, uh, south of America, you have to be very focused on your data centers. And uh, AI, for the moment, after eight years in Credit Mutuel, uh, is involved in 20% of our sellings and the return on investment is above 30 percent and now we are moving for quantum uh, and uh, on the very uh, on the co cooperation with IBM with a data center in Frankfurt because we asked IBM to put the uh, center in Europe to ensure full protection and if I may digitalization this is the window dressing for customers. The real problem from a company is uh, a full control on the architecture, investment, and strategy on IT. And of course, having that, you can be perfectly digitalized. You can be very efficient for your customer. Sorry for this uh, very traditional way, but uh, uh, for example, uh, next year we'll have three uh, tier four data centers in France. And from my point of view, this is a key and basic condition of each and every bank in the market because you cannot be resilient, you cannot be solid, you cannot ensure your uh, capital ratio without a full control on your IT system. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Jose. Yeah, please. no, I just wanted to come back on that because I hear you, but that my sense is that that's a, a strategy that is not the common rule right now in the industry. The trends that we see are really going in the other direction, which we see large amounts of externalizations, making a lot of value added chains, particularly in the IT front. In the IT front, and that's, uh, we put forward a regulation in Europe that you may be familiar with, which is called DORA, Digital Operational Resilience, precisely because there's concerns that some of the banks, some of the financial institutions, not just banks, have more and more difficulty having control over the value added chain of their production process, and also the supervisors have also, as a result, not confirmed that that whole value of the chain is sufficiently robust to potential risk, particularly resilient risk. So this is actually a major area in which we're working now. If I may vary, that's an additional complexity, which is not only breaks out the value of the chain within banks, but also connects the value of the chain across financial institutions and actually across other sectors in the economy. So the, inter the intersectoral relationships intersectoral connections becomes more and more. And I think as we go forward, that's probably one of the key areas of vulnerability that we see right now for the coming years and making sure that we assess that properly. Any other implications that you're seeing or how about AI? I mean, it's early days, but how's that going to affect banking supervision? Yeah, well, if I may, before I go to AI, yeah, another thing that I think is very important for us as, as supervisory authorities overall is to build human capital. You know, it's, it's an area in which uh, when we think about and when we do surveys, where we think there's like a tighter market. And now that we are, as the ABA and the other supervisory authorities, building up our, our capabilities and our strength to do the digital operational resilience act that I mentioned before, the ability to have the right capital, human capital, is very important. And one of the initiatives that we have here in Europe is we build this with the support of the, of the Commission, the Digital um, Academy for supervisors, the Digital Supervisory Academy, in which we're providing training to try to, to build that up. I think that's very important. Now, when you think about AI, I think more than AI... Did you want to respond to that? I saw you nodding. Did you have something to say? That, no, that no, no, no. Please, please carry on. No, yeah. okay, sorry. No, I was just coming back now to your question on, on artificial intelligence. I mean, it's obviously something that we monitor and we started to monitor like I think everybody else. And I think we have to monitor from two perspectives, which is always good. It's like one, uh, what are uh, supervised entities doing with it? and what are the implications they may, of, of those changes that they incorporate to their systems. And at the same time, we have, we have to look inside ourselves and what can we do ourselves in a different way, in a better way. I think both of those 
levers need to be pursued. At this stage, I would say it's probably too early to draw any conclusions. It's a new technology. When I mentioned technological neutrality, I think it's important to see what the use cases come out of there. Um, uh, not necessarily be open or close, just be honest and fair to that technology, what it can offer. But I think, at least from my perspective, what, what we can do with it ourselves is almost just as important as what the industry can do itself with that technology. Kerstin, do you want to add yeah, to that? Yeah, maybe because I'm rather proud that we have a, in our uh, SSM uh, activities developed, I think, rather cutting edge uh, tools. And uh, one is something we call Heimdall, and uh, it is uh, reviewing the application for, you know, we are fit and proper testing all um, board members, for example, in a bank, and we are getting thousands of those uh, fit and proper applications a year. So here we have an automatic, you can say, review of those uh, applications to uh, translate them, to make sure that all the information we need are in the applications. And then there are, of course, also a human uh, hand looking at them, but I think this for first uh, way of reviewing them is really helpful. So this is something that we are already using on a daily basis. We have also developed a sort of database with the I mean, main uh, um, analytics for our uh, supervisors. And I think that is also something very useful. And we have our intranet, so I mean, they have access to this uh, information uh, directly. And, and then the vision, maybe this uh, sounds a little bit bad for the banks, but I think the vision is, of course, that we can also have some real-time in time information from banks, because rather often we hear that uh, if we want to check liquidity, for example, we need it now. I mean, to get a report uh, three months uh, after uh, is not really uh, interesting. So. Here again, I mean, this is something that we would like to see. Not, of course, that we not that we will have direct access to the bank's books, but some uh, key indicators would be important also for us to, to see on a real-time basis. That's really interesting, Nicolas. Yeah. Pause it. Oh, yes, sorry. Yeah. Um, just to add a specific here in terms of dealing with the unknown. Yeah. Um, my bank offers me voice recognition. Mm -hmm. Maybe a lot of people in the room voice recognition. Now, that is utterly vulnerable these days, yeah. courtesy of Jane I. Right? Mm. And yet my bank is still offering me voice recognition. And I've said, guys, this is just not good enough. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it'll take them six months to recognize that problem. Yeah. That's the nature of the risks that are yeah. so present good and imminent in the market. Yeah, not just on AI. My feeling is that the real debate is about the use you are making with AI. And we adopted AI uh, eight years ago. And uh, we refused the sort of big replacement theory, AI, uh, robots, replacing advisors uh, with the customers. And in reality, uh, AI is very good in our businesses uh, on uh, opportunities, frauds, uh, identification of uh, potentialities, just like uh, quantum uh, calculation. And, uh, when you put this kind of uh, uh, advices, opportunities, uh, frauds to the advisors, they are very efficient. Their efficiency is increasing, and uh, what we try to do is to enhance the relationship between the advisors and the customers. And when we look at it uh, uh, eight years later, it's really uh, good and efficient. So. Uh, when you are uh, inventing a technology, the real problem is uh, how you will use it. You can use your computer just to beat someone, <laughs> or you can use it to help you. Uh, and that's the real choice on yeah. AI. It's fascinating. I think it's going to be interesting to see at the next forum how the conversation's moved on. It's changing so rapidly. Marlene, can I get your take? Is it yeah. AI blessing or a curse then for the banking supervision? Well, let me first just uh, add before I answer this question uh, that I very much agree with Jose that it has definitely these two sides. So one side is uh, the industry. So we just conducted uh, an extensive survey in the Swiss financial markets, not just with banks, but also with uh, insurance company, uh, companies. And what we found is that basically all of the large uh, institutions and most of the mid-size and small institutions already use one way or the other uh, artificial intelligence. 
Uh, most of the apps are at the front of this or uh, in the process optimization, though this is two thirds of the applications. And uh, what, what is uh, also very interesting I found is that most of the banks, they do not only outsource uh, the development of uh, artificial intelligence, but they also start uh, their own uh, artificial uh, intelligence uh, programming. So there is, this, there is this mixture. So here and now, I think we already see that financial markets uh, already are very much reacting to artificial intelligence and, and, and using artificial intelligence. And then there is this other side, this would be the subtech mm -hmm. uh, side. So when we uh, supervisors actually make use of the latest uh, technology, I think there it's really very important uh, that at the very end we'll always have a human being who takes the final uh, decision. I think it's, it's uh, of great uh, uh, use and importance if uh, artificial intelligence is used to guide where human beings look further. But I think at the end, the final decision should should always be uh, with uh, should always be uh, with, with with humans. But when you ask me about uh, whether it's a blessing or or a curse, to to me it seems um, the. The factor that kind of ticks the, uh, to one or the other side is, is really accountability. If uh, the system is set up in a, in a way that it's always clear to where is this door to knock on when things go wrong and that there is still some sort of a door to knock on when things go wrong, I think then we can really benefit from uh, the, the great uh, potential of artificial intelligence. But when it's unclear who is at the end held accountable, I think then we're, then, then we're definitely headed uh, for very, very challenging times as, uh, as, as supervisors. And, and so I think there is, this, uh, there is this saying about banking is necessary, but banks are not. And I would, I would tempted to uh, kind of alter it a little bit by saying uh, banking is necessary. Banks might not be, but what's definitely necessary is a bank license. So you always need to be absolutely clear about who is held accountable uh, for uh, handling customers and handling investors. Thank you. I'm sure there's lots more to come back on on that, but I'm going to move it on to transparency. I promised we would talk more about that. Um, external institutional stakeholders and financial market players have repeatedly called on ECB banking supervision to increase transparency. I'd like to bring in our audience. You didn't think you were just going to sit there and do nothing. Um, and with a little show of hands, I'm going to ask you a question. Are supervisors, what do you think, are supervisors around the globe doing enough to be transparent? Hands up for yes, they're doing enough. Okay. Oh, yep, one over there. Good. Thanks, Connie. And uh, yep, good. And hands up for no, they're not doing enough to be transparent. <laughs> and I, yeah, okay. And some neutral, but certainly more for not enough. I think that was quite definitive. So, yeah, and I think one of the big questions is around how you balance transparency and confidentiality. So, Nicola, let me come to you first. Do you want to see more transparency from supervisors? With, with me, yes. <laughs> <laughs> with the others, I don't know. Um, no, uh, I think there is a need for uh, what I call visibility, but uh, a common agenda. Basically, we, we, we should, both the banks and the supervisor, be absolutely transparent in terms of common agenda. And if I may, uh, between the different supervisors, it would help to have this kind of common agenda uh, uh, and uh, with an absolute need of transparency. And the second criteria for me is alignment. You should never say a customer or a market or an investor uh, something different from what you say to your supervisor. And the reverse is also true. And uh, uh, I think this kind of principles, uh, transparency and alignment, uh, are the good ones to, to progress and to create uh, confidence. And to be honest, I think we did make a lot of progress from this point of view, including supervisors, uh, the frank dialogue, and the kind of selectivity between what you say on an all basis 
to the banks, what you say on a written basis, and what you say to the market. And these three levels of uh, transparency are needed. We need uh, a very good informal dialogue. We need a clarity on the written dialogue. And we need, of course, uh, to, to observe, to obey, or to uh, follow uh, the instructions, the public instructions coming from the authorities. Kirsten, a lot of progress has been made hearing that there, but what steps need to be taken are being taken to increase transparency? I think we have lot, uh, we have done a lot, uh, not least because Andrea has been, uh, I think uh, someone said you have been a champion in transparency, but uh, we have tried to improve our transparency during uh, the last five years. And uh, uh, one thing is that we have, uh, we are now publishing the result from the supervisory review and evaluation process, the aggregate results. Uh, we are also uh, publishing the, the stress test result for individual banks. We are publishing the methodology for the SREP process because banks have asked, I mean, how come that we are scored uh, two or three or three plus? I mean, we need to understand better what is the thoughts behind. So we are doing more work in this area and we will probably publish also uh, more on the methodological side. Uh, our banking supervision market contact group was mentioned here earlier, but that has been also uh, the idea behind is to increase the dialogue with the market for us to explain why we are doing things in one way or another, but also for the market to be able to, to raise questions with us. And uh, over the last years, we have also been a little bit more uh, careful with how we are communicating. I mean, communicating with our banks is one thing, and there we can be open and hopefully also explain very well why uh, we uh, are assessing banks in one way or another. But then we, we are an independent authority, so and we are accountable to the European citizens, to the Parliament, to the Commission. I mean, there are a number of stakeholders here, so we need to choose how we communicate with the different stakeholders. Uh, we have our website, of course, but we are also now communicating in social media in different ways in order to reach out. And Andrea, of course, has been in the parliament regularly to report to the politicians, because that's important that they also understand how we are working, why we are taking certain decisions, and also that we are able to, to explain, I mean, our view on the banking sector. Okay, David, what are the challenges then between transparency and confidentiality? Yeah, I remember in when Andrea began the whole stress testing, and when he was at the EBA, in fact, um, we've been on a colossal journey with respect to communicating to the markets on a consistent basis across all the banks. So where we were 10 years ago and where we are now, frankly, is night and day. Mm. And this is an area where very controversially I think enough is being done. Why? Because careful what you wish for. Mm. You. If you start putting out there things that then the market overinterprets or underinterprets, whatever it may be, then you're causing a problem. And it feels to me like we've really got the, place, uh, the market in a place where they understand all the disclosures that are done by the SSM, they've internalized them, they know where to probe them, and the discussion moves on. So controversially, I wouldn't really do much more. The one, the one bit of transparency that nobody's really talked about, which is, I think, Merlin, you and I had a little, uh, a little disagreement here. I, I worry enormously when I hear banks say, well, we could just give supervisors perfect access to our loan tapes, say our credit books, and so they know everything that we're doing, and what could possibly go wrong with that? Now, you create the most monstrous moral hazard, right? You can imagine if the bank says, well, the supervisor knows everything I'm doing, if they're not telling me I've got a problem, then there is no problem. And that's how you get into trouble, right? So I worry enormously about that part of transparency, which is how and how frequently the banks um, transmit the information to the SSM and in what basis. Because if we get too frequent and too transparent, I worry about big moral hazards coming into play. Nicola Quickly, as our banking representative, is that a fair comment? That's a fair comment, provided that uh, you are absolutely transparent on your global risks. 
of course, you don't have to give to the supervisor each and every loan, but uh, notably on risk uh, under uh, uh, the, the, the interest rate uh, risk, uh, of course, on your strategy, you have to be very clear. And uh, if I may, that this is a danger of the ratios. Uh, mm. Maybe it's a, a side comment, but uh, uh, knowing the price of everything is knowing the value of nothing. And uh, at a certain stage, I'm a bit careful with the figures, with the ratios, because uh, you have to put the global picture beyond each and every loan and to see if the management, the governance, and Andrea has underlined that, is okay as a function of reaction. And I think that's where the transparency needs to be absolute. This is my function of reaction in case of I would do that or I would do that. And that's more important than ratios and figures because at the end of the day, figures is just about reassuring the system but not giving the, the real value mm. yeah. of what you're doing. Very quickly, maybe yes, one these quick uh, re remarks. Uh, I think in, in, in short, transparency does not mean necessarily more data or more uh, access to more information, but access to the right uh, information. So I think just if we are flooded with information from banks and if there is a pipeline directly uh, from in, to the extreme, uh, from uh, financial institutions to the to supervisory uh, authority, that, that's not necessarily transparent. Transparency. Transparency is about not, not about more data, but about the specific, the, the right data. And I think that, that should be the, the, the focus. Thank you. If, if, if I may, I mean, because I think we're mixing two levels of transparency uh, in this conversation. One is transparency between a, a private relationship between a supervisor and a supervised entity, which is, has to do with more with predictability, I will say. Another one is transparency to the outside world of how that relationship is going. Mm -hmm and or what's the status of the banking sector in particular, the bank in particular. I think on, on the second aspect, on the transparency of how that relationship is going, I think that you have to be prudent. On the third aspect, on giving information about the situation of the banks, I think the experience has shown as we go forward that has always been confident enhancing in general. You know, I think that particularly when there is a focus of concern in a particular area, uh, not being transparent, not being clear on where the information is, ends up being just uh, ground for speculation rather than, 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 than having an intelligent conversation. I think, I think that communication to third parties, of course, at the EBA, since, since, uh, since Andrea started, we've always been very keen on providing information to markets to the point that we have something that we call the transparency exercise of the banking sector that we do twice a year. But I think that that, that aspect is important. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Right, I'm going to move us on. There's lots I want us to cover in this session and it's going so quickly. <coughs> Let's talk about lessons learned as we look to the future with the recent banking failures, what lessons have been learned or not. I'm going to come to you first, Marlene, with the Swiss perspective or general perspective. Well, obviously, I mean, there have been um, two very different cases, the, the US banks and uh, the, the Swiss banks, and I'm only going to uh, comment on the latter, uh, obviously. Um, I mean, there are uh, many lessons to, to be drawn from, th from this. Uh, many people hope that uh, there would be just one main lesson or one aspect, one magic wand tool uh, that uh, we, we can kind of install and then uh, uh, incidences as we've seen will t would never happen. But I think that's, that's, that's clearly an illusion. So we, we, need, we have a variety of different, uh, of different uh, le lessons uh, to, be, to be learned. And uh, in the context of modern uh, supervision, in the other context, in the broader context we could go on for a, for a forum on its own <laughs> um, uh, but in the in the context of modern uh, supervision I think I, I want to mention uh, uh, two two lessons uh, the, the first one is uh, Corporate governance is of utmost importance. That's really also what Andreas is also so much uh, em emphasizing. So uh, whether uh, it's a traditional business model or a very modern one, uh, if the corporate governance is not uh, sound, uh, then we're uh, headed for, for for challenges or troubles as we've as, as we've seen. And the challenge with corporate governance is that there. there likely will never be kind of one metric that will basically 
represent and signal what uh, is the stance of corporate governance. I mean, there is a feeling, we can uh, look into the market, we can use market uh, uh, figures uh, to get a judgment on what, what the market thinks about the corporate governance in a particular institution. But, but still, there will be no quantifiable measure as we have with liquidity or with, with, uh, with capital. And from that, I think the, the, the lesson learned is that we as supervisor, we really need Need, uh, the power and the legal clarity to uh, be able to intervene very early on. And uh, so in our case, in the Swiss case, we now aim for a, a senior manager regime among other uh, aspects, just to make uh, clear that we have kind of better cards uh, uh, for handling, to, to handle this type of corporate governance uh, challenges. And the next, the, the second lesson, uh, I think, which is important in the context of, of modern banking uh, is, of course, liquidity. I think I think we've uh, seen this massive bank run. Some uh, call it a, a digital bank run. And yes, we've come a very long way from Basel II to Basel III and, uh, uh, on, on, on liquidity measures. So back in 2008, we did not have really uh, a common ground. How we, have, we did not have the LCR uh, and FSCR to really measure uh, uh, liquidity, so we've come a, a, a very long way, uh, but having said this, it's also obvious that th there is still room to further um, uh, to further increase uh, kind of what we can learn from, from these type of measures. So different type of depositors and, and uh, different regions. And I think that that's definitely uh, an important lesson uh, that we need to, to draw and look closer into these uh, liquidity measures. This is even more the case when we have uh, not a traditional uh, business model as was with Credit Suisse, but uh, when we have these more uh, advanced or these, these more technology-driven uh, uh, business models. Thank you. Jose Manuel, do you agree? Your thoughts? I agree with everything that has been said to me. I mean, if I might say just uh, two, two broader comments. First, that you have to be humble, you know, because you never know that it can happen to you. I think that's important. And then the second aspect is that we need to, and, and Andrea pointed to some of these earlier in his comments with the conversation with Laros here, but you need to be able to, how to, in incorporate into the supervisory agenda and your assessment of, these, of, of the banks and the situation. So like uh, market, but I don't mean by market, just financial market information, but just market information that moves very bad. Social media, uh, perceptions, uh, market prices, that may be in price there. I don't think we need to go 100% to market prices, but how to incorporate all that sort of high frequency information that's wandering around, that's moving faster and faster and faster, and they might materialize into a weakness that you haven't seen. I think that's probably, and, and that's hard to do. I mean, the liquidity part is very clear that we need to work on that, but also how do we integrate social media information, how do we integrate information coming from equity markets or the 81 markets that interact with each other. I think that's something that we need to work through. Kerstin, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, we are, of course, also studying the reports that have uh, been provided by Federal Reserve and the lessons learned and also by the Basel Committee. And my take from those two uh, reports is that very much of the, I mean, uh, faults or problems were linked to uh, governance and risk management, both in the banks and in the supervisory authorities. So, and uh, if you go, if you have an extreme uh, a business model and you don't have a good risk management and good governance, then it's not, it cannot be compensated with a lot of capital or liquidity. If there is not trust in a bank, then there is a problem. And I think that was what we saw uh, very simplified in the US banks. Uh, but I think for us, uh, the lesson learned is also as a supervisor, you need to act. It was, uh, if you see something that doesn't work, you need to act. And uh, that was mentioned in the first panel. Uh, of course, there shall always be a discussion with the bank and the bank is, they need to have time to uh, take a rectifying, uh, I mean, uh, measures. But if they don't, uh, you need as a supervisor to be there and 
use your, your tools in order to press on the banks to make the right things. And I think here, I mean, we can have the, we can take as an example the uh, climate uh, risk uh, here in uh, the SSM. We issued our supervisory expectations on what banks need to do when it comes to climate exposures and their risk management around the climate exposures. And, uh, and um, uh, here we have had a number of intermediate uh, stops where we need to see deliveries from the banks and we haven't seen that from all the banks so now we are escalating in what we call I mean that's a jargon among the supervisors but we we escalate then and um, continue the discussion with the banks but at the end I mean we can use our tools like capital add-ons or we, we have also a, uh, um, a, a mon uh, we can use uh, other uh, fees that we can apply on the banks. Nicola, you heard that about the escalating. Was that your takeaway too, that supervisors need to act more quickly? They need to act adequately. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if I may, on the lessons learned, one uh, short word, the business model is everything. Mm. Uh, uh, when you have a balanced business model, when you have a universal bank, when from our side, you add uh, insurance business, uh, mobile phones, uh, housing protection. You keep the client, the customer inside your uh, perimeter. Uh, at the end of the day, when you have a, the threat of a bank run, I believe it's better uh, to have a, a very global relationship with the customer because uh, Put him at the, at the end of the day to earn money in our industry, you need to keep customers uh, more than five years and to give them one more than two or three products. You can have very clever people about uh, segmentation, uh, equipment and so on, but at the end of the day, retail banking is about more than five years and more than two or three products. And that's where even against crisis like we had, uh, I think it's a good protection business model. David, did you want to? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to reinforce everything that you said. I'm going to brandish my <laughs> laurel wreath again. Because if you look at the individuals involved in those banking crises, you had exhibit A for the dominant chief executive, very little check and balance within the firm, and then absent supervision. I mean, SVB was screamingly obvious that it was weak. It was a business model that couldn't possibly stand up to any kind of market stress. Nothing happened. And so, importance of supervision, the governance, S, S, um, S, Marlena. having a, no, no, the, the accountability framework, accountability. super important, but also the supervisor that has to have the whole knowledge of the business model to be able to have a reasonable conversation mm -hmm. about vulnerabilities is beyond the ratios that Nicola was talking about and the capital requirements. So, my laurel wreath again. <laughs> Glad to see it again. Can't come too many times. Um, so we're talking about the need to adapt as we move forward. Let's, let's move on to that. Discussions about adaptation are going on globally, like the Basel core principles we've talked about. Well, they've been mentioned. Kirsten, can you tell us a bit more about them and the conversations that you're involved in that are going on? Yeah, I'm not myself involved, but the Basel core principles for banking supervision, they are under review. And the core principles, they were... Uh, the first time they were issued, I think it was 1997, and then they were re reviewed in uh, 2012. And now there has been another review after the crisis we have been through. And the whole thing with those Basel core principles is to make sure that uh, it's principles to make sure that uh, supervisors around the globe have a high standard that, that we are working more or less in the same uh, fashion. Uh, what I can see from the uh, revised now core principles is that there will be um, new focuses on uh, sustainable business models that has not been in there before. But uh, with what has happened, I mean, it's not rather clear that we need to make sure that banks have sustainable business models. Climate risk has not been covered in the, those core principles, so that will be another area. 
operational resilience is also important. I think it has been there, but now it's uh, more evident. And with operational resilience, it's about, of course, uh, cyber risk and uh, other I mean, risk in that area. But, and it is a growing importance that banks are also focusing, investing, and making sure that they have uh, experts and risk management procedures in place. And there was also a fourth area, and that is the exposures to the non-financial uh, um, sectors that was also mentioned here in the first panel. But this is a little bit of a growing area and where we can see that uh, we need to have an increased focus, um, not necessarily banking supervisors, but there may be exposures from banks to the this uh, sector that is growing and then we need to maybe have a better grip and maybe we also need to understand better if there is a need for more regulation or supervision in that area. Nicola, thoughts on that? What more adaption regulation is needed? <laughs> of course, no, but if I may, uh, I think on climate we need more regulation and then more clarity because uh, uh, we need more clearer deadlines and uh, I agree basically uh, what was said that uh, on climate we need a, a common rule for banks but also for all other actors and industries because at the end of the day if industries are not forced to decarbonize uh, it's not uh, up to the funding machine to, to find the solution uh, against uh, the, the technicians. So that's where and I, I would say we need a global regulation on climate, much more ambitious, and with no delays and no too much transitions. Too many transitions. Mm -hmm. Jose Manuel, do you agree with what you're hearing? Absolutely. What's your take over yeah, there? I, mean, I, I, I wouldn't say that we need more regulation. I think what we need to do is we need to assess where are the potential areas of new risks that we need to watch for? And it's technology and sustainability, clearly the two brothers. I mean, we have the classical ones that will continue on the interest rates and all these areas, but the new risks potentially may come, also many opportunities. So this is not uh, to under, underscore those opportunities, but since we're talking about supervisors, we're focused on risks. So it's mainly technology and sustainability. We talked a fair amount about technology, but I think sustainability is very important. I think that, you know, uh, I think we, I would like to get more regulation, but before, before we get to more regulation, we need to understand very well what we're regulating. So what we need to do is to do to work more. I'm going to call it on experimentation. Maybe that's the wrong word. You know, but if we all try to figure out how to address this challenge, and we really put the foot into there, then we'll figure out the real good key levers that will put us into what we should be doing or what we should not be doing, and then have the regulation. In the, in the meantime, I think we all need to, on, on, on the aspect of sustainability, I think we all need to be aware that need to be doing more. And that should be the key message for the banks, they need to be doing more, for the underlying companies, they need to be doing more in enhancing the, the, their data and their measurement. From our perspective, we need to be doing more in trying to get better at understanding how we can start putting limits on what's going well and what's not going so well. Yes, please. Can I put a different angle on this? Sure. I, in sustainability, I just think we need much better regulation because we have ended up with the regulated sector being cut out of any of the toxic, the really difficult abatement questions. And we've got the unregulated sector that can go all nil in there. And private equity firms are making a lot of money out of financing coal projects, for example. Mm. So we've created this dichotomy between the regulated sector and the unregulated sector by this taxonomy concept. And I think we're getting really perverse incentives here. And people like them are being judged on totally different basis to the private market operators. And so we're only creating opportunity for the unregulated sector to compete against them in a very, very unfair way. And that, that to me, just feels like a very dangerous place to be. We've created an arbitrage, basically. I, I would challenge that a little bit if I You challenge, if challenge away. I'm not sure what we mean by regulated versus unregulated. What's regulated mean in the, in the context of sustainability in the banking sector? The taxonomy is widely applied. It applies for asset, asset managers, it applies for investor base, it applies for a large amount of financing into the, into, the, into the overall economy. I would not say that there's a lot of banking specific taxonomy regulation that's really Putting in the, at least in the potential for right now, all we have is really some 
active, act, active action and indications on pillar two from the point of view of supervisors at this stage. But there's not really, there's not really any pillar one really significant regulation on sustainability aspects. I think it's I think overall it was, financial sector. But that's my point, Jose Manuel. The private equity sector right now can do as much as they want in the... But the private equity needs to get the money from some investors which need to comply with some taxonomy on that part of the investor base. So, which is, Thank you. I like a little, a little debate. That's good. <laughs> Very quickly, then, I want to open up to audience questions. I just wanted to ask you, Jose Manuel, the EBA framework, is that still working well? The EBA framework is work in <laughs> process. I, of course, if it's the EBA framework, it's working well for the, by definition. But now, more seriously, <laughs> as I said before, it's work in progress. We have a roadmap in, which, in this area system in which we're working you know, to try to put forward some of the regulations. We are putting forward some pillar three disclosures. That's, I think it's working well originally. We're working on a, a stress test, uh, what's called a fit for 55, to test the fit for 55 strategy of the, of the, of the European Commission and the European Union. You know, uh, that's jointly with the other supervisory authorities to try to build that going forward. And we're contributing to the regulatory agenda in the taxonomy, in the, trying to identify what's financial greenwashing. We're providing some advice of the commission on that. So it's an agenda that I think is working. But as I said before, my sense is, we are doing a lot, but I wonder if it's still enough. And I think that's what everybody should be in the, in the mindset from my perspective. Okay, thank you. Right, we'll open up to audience questions. I've got a couple coming through here online. So we've got a hand there already, let's take that. If you wanted to say who you are, which organization, and if you have someone for me, you want me to put it to, otherwise I'll open it up. Yeah, thank you. It's Alistair Ryan, Bank of America. So in the, in the spirit of modern, hang on, I'll stand up then. It's been a modern supervision, so it's an options pricing question. Um, so you've, you've got a lot of options. You've accrued a lot of options. Uh, the right to add capital requirements, macroprudential rules, um, climate change, stress, um, supervisory add-ons for corporate governance, early interventions, <laughs> and as the Swiss experience, the right to bail in AT1, or the threat of bailing in TLAC bonds, which obviously was a large part of the collapse of Credit Suisse. So the market collectively tells you that we've written you those options and they've been very expensive for us. So as Anna Bottin uh, referenced before, um, her bank's facing an 18% cost of equity, which is a, a really difficult number for Europe because the European banking system can't make 18%. So how does a modern supervisor think about the cost of the options it's accrued to itself in the light of the evidence that the market's finding those expensive? Thank you. And who would you like that question to? Oh, everybody. Okay, who wants to take it? Who wants to take it first? <laughs> okay, Kirsten, then I'll throw that to you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is, of course, an important question. And uh, so we have also uh, opened up with the, our market contact group to discuss with the market. And I think we understand very well their view. But as a supervisor, we need to make sure that we have a sound and prudent banking sector, that they are resilient and that they can continue and support the European economy. And I think that is uh, the uh, goal. And of course, uh, we as supervisor, we have a responsibility not to overdo supervision, but the banks have also a huge responsibility here to make sure that they have sustainable business models and that they can support the economy in a very good way. Thank you. I'll take one of the online ones and I'll come back to you. I've, the question is, what's the biggest change to European banking supervision you want to see 10 more years down the road? Um, Nicola, do you want to take that first? Honestly, uh, I do not see, I, I, I told about uh, the, the main challenges, but uh, I think it's a bit difficult to, to, to go in 10 years time. Sorry for that. That's fine, absolutely. <laughs> David, did you want to yeah. give your thoughts? I think I've got one, and I'm, because Dominique is here. I, I feel the going concern, gone concern, supervision question is a big one for us to institutionally tackle. And the reason why I raise this is, A, in a crisis, you need these two to be joined up very quickly and have a common view. And it's not clear whether our structure at the moment makes that easy. The second thing is, back to Alistair's point, the, the carrot and the stick. You can make yourself a lot more resolvable as a financial institution 
if you make some choices about your operating model that have nothing to do with the capital and liquidity requirements. They have a little bit to do, but it's about the operating model. And I firmly believe that a bank that is very resolvable ought to get some credit from the supervisors for having gone through that transition and made themselves resolvable now. In fact, that happened in, in Switzerland, not, not obviously with Credit Suisse, but with others, mm -hmm. where there was a bit of a carrot and stick with respect to the options. There was a negative option as well, that if you made, your, if you made that choice, you got a benefit or a capital deduction, whatever that may be. And I think that would be a really powerful way of making our banks focus on the right things that really made a difference with respect to the option pricing that, that Alistair was, was alluding to. That's, that's a hard one. No, I'm not saying it's an easy thing to do. Huh? No? Yeah, please. No, just uh, very quickly. To me, it's obvious that uh, some of the so like uh, things that were left to be done from the previous session, I hope that get done over the next 10 years. You know, so like mm -hmm. making sure that we have uh, resilience, cross-border banking in the union, some of the issues about deepening the banking union. It, it has nothing to do with supervision mainly, or, but, but I hope the supervisor at least helps in that direction to help that grow and that, that will, you know, become less of a conversation 10 years from now. Nicolas. Uh, if I may want to compliment, uh, I think that the main challenge for me would be the balance between the regulated entities and the non-regulated entities because uh, we, we have a problem of supervision of the non-regulated entities. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, if we want to fund the economy and to, to fund the transition uh, in the right way, I very much prefer to go through the regulated entities and the banks rather than having uh, the kind of uh, uh, discrepancies that we have today. So at a certain stage, we should think about real businesses and not institutions only. Okay, thank you. Yeah, hand over there, lady in the black jumper. Good evening, and um, thank you for taking my question. Francesca Tamma, Banco BPM Italy. I've got a question about the climate risk uh, topic, which is indeed very important. And, and as a an European citizen, I really appreciate what uh, everything you're doing, both as the uh, EBA and the ECB for this topic. But I've got a, a big uh, doubt, which is, we have got to say in Italy, which is, parlare a nuora perché suocera intenda which can be loosely translated as uh, uh, talking to the daughter-in-law in order to make the mother-in-law understand. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the question. Are we really sure that we are addressing the right uh, addressee with all this uh, supervisor pressure? There is anything we can do in order to address better governments, which should be the intended recipient of these sort of challenges. Who wants to take that? Jose Manuel, Kirsten? Well, yeah. I, I'll be very brief. I, I think, I don't know exactly what your analogy is pointing to, but if you're suggesting that we should do the climate policy through banking supervision, I'm always reluctant to that. No, I think that banking supervision and banking uh, should do well what is that, which is that there's an underlying risk that we think is there, that is at present, that, needs to, that is likely to materialize, and we need to make sure that the financial sector is properly addressing those risks and is well prepared to finance the economy to wherever it's going. So if, if what you meant is that we're trying to do climate policy through banking supervision, I hope we're not, because that would be the wrong task. Kerstin. Yeah, climate and environmental risk is, of course, very important. And that's why we have been working on this for at least uh, three years now. But I mean, w our aim is to make sure that bank can uh, risk manage uh, climate and environmental risk in the same way as they are doing with all other risks they have uh, in their balance sheet. So we can just work within our mandate. And this is, I mean, we think it is, of course, very important, but governments need to also work on their side, of yeah. course. Thank you. Yeah, question over there. Is that working? Yeah, uh, Tom McAleese from A&M again. Um, going concern to gone concern seems to be getting a lot quicker. Uh, what we've seen from SVB and Credit Suisse and the speed that deposits ran out of those banks. What are the regulators thinking 
about that because we've never seen uninsureds moving out of SPV very quickly, the same in Credit Suisse, and then the, 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 uh, the digital money moving so quickly as well. That's a big concern because you're looking at a bank like Credit Suisse, for instance, profitable bank, was, had decent capital, decent liquidity. Big issue was business model, as you say, right? They came out, they had three good business, Swiss Bank, Asset Management Bank, and Wealth Management Bank. They had one very bad bank, the investment bank. The company came out with a revised strategy at the end of August and said, we're keeping the investment bank, we're reducing it by 40%, disaster. But we're still limping along and then the deposits just started to move. That's scary because you've got a bank that's actually limping along in a going concern situation and then can fall off the track very quickly. So what's your, what's your question? What's your view on this deposit moving? Oh, deposit moving, okay. That's, Marlene? That's concerning. Yeah. Yeah. Marlene, do you want to take that? So, uh, as, as I mentioned, so I think the, the, the focus on liquid, liquidity is, is, uh, is really instrumental. I mean, we've seen in Credit Suisse in one quarter, outflows of 160 billion so and uh, this is really massive and we also saw that Credit Suisse was among the G-SIPs, the, the, the most liquid G-SIP just before this happened. So uh, I think this, this tells us already a lot about the, the, the speed uh, of the outflows. And I think the speed is uh, something we really need to uh, look into. Uh, one way to, uh, the, the obvious way uh, to, to counterbalance that is uh, a pillar two. Uh, in the case of Credit Suisse, we installed the pillar two uh, two years in advance. So we installed it, we, we lifted it uh, already in the summer of 2020. So that was one of the reasons why uh, uh, the liquidity ratio were so high right before uh, uh, these uh, October events. But after that, I think pillar two can only take you uh, so far. So after that, there is clearly also a, a, a role for the lender of last resource. So then we need to look into uh, the, the, the collateral that is related uh, uh, to the, the, the facilities there. So I think that, that's definitely something we need to look into. And there is no kind of clear and obvious answer uh, here, here and now, uh, other than uh, we need to develop the further those uh, monitoring systems that we have currently in place and also uh, need to make uh, sure that uh, we have aside from pillar two also other measures uh, to address these these particular these particular issues thank you Nicola did you want to add to that yeah uh, on liquidity I'm both modest and obsessed uh, it can happen that you, you, you should be absolutely obsessed into your balance of liquidity. If I may, at the very early stage, the, your problem is transforming your customers into partners and not players against the bank. And that's where transparency, uh, the, 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 the intensity of relationship, the different fields of uh, businesses, uh, asset management, uh, traditional bank, insurance, and so on, it's key because at the end of the day, if you have a question on confidence, on the trust your customers are uh, putting into the bank, it's lost, it's already lost. So the obsession of service, and that's where digitalization could be a danger because if you, bet too much on digitalization without advice, the duty of advice, without somebody uh, enhancing the relationship, you create the situation where your customers become commodities. And in this case, that's real and present danger. And you're beyond figures from my point of view on that, because this is the early stage and that's really where you can act as responsible of a bank. Okay. Naomi, can I just add? Yes, you can. The trust is also between the tripartites, the supervisor, the GON concern, and the ministries of finance. And their ability to move in sync and quickly and have a very clear communication of the market, super, super important, right? So the trust works both ways, both with clients as well as with the relevant authorities. Okay, I'm seeing nodding in response. We are nearly at time. I want to ask you very quickly, all of you, just before we finish, my question to each of you in turn is, how positive are you about the future of European banking supervision? And if you could make one wish for its evolution, what would it be? We'll start with you, Nicola, and we'll go around that way. Only one, what? 
<laughs> I am optimistic about the European banking industry and supervision because for me it's really linked. And uh, I would hope for some simplification on details and uh, let's focus on the essentials. Thank you. Also optimistic, Naomi. One point I've already raised, which is the join up of gone concern and going concern. And then the second is the Shrep process, which I, I think can be a really, really powerful tool. And the supervisors will continue to invest in that to make it very different from a compliance driven thing. So forward looking business model centric Shrep process. So I would like to broaden your question. I mean, I hope that the banking union will come into force so that we have all three pillars there. I think Europe really needs a strong banking union and banking supervision is, of course, part of that. But there will be a number of challenges here in the coming years. So we need banks and we need good financial markets in order to finance all the investments that we will see. Thank you. Very similar to Kristen. You know, I think that the experience of the last 10 years has showed that this is going in the right direction. Let's make sure it's filling up. Let's make sure that we can get the glass to be completely full. And for me as a Swiss, I don't have a, a wish, but I have a big yeah. thank you uh, for the uh, cooperation uh, with all the uh, European institutions and particularly also to, to Andrea and particularly also uh, during this year. So this is much appreciated and rest assured that we do everything to also further foster and, and increase these, uh, these cooperation among the, the, the European institutions. Well, nice to end on a note of optimism, shared optimism. So would you join me in thanking our wonderful panellists for such an enlightening and wonderful conversation? Thank you.